So this morning, we are coming to the conclusion of our study in the book of Genesis. Um, initially, we were planning on kind of doing a study on the main characters in the book of Genesis, but as we kept studying, we ended up going chapter by chapter and realizing there was so much in this book that God was trying to teach us from. And so I'm grateful that we actually changed our plans and we actually took time to study this book. Genesis is a book of beginnings. It begins to some, answer some of the great philosophical questions of human history. Where did everything come from? What is the meaning and purpose of life? How can we know right from wrong? What is the, uh, does humanity have an ultimate destiny? We began this series by studying the life of Adam and creation, and we, re we read about God's act of creation. And Genesis is not a science book. It's not an astrology book. It's not an astronomy book. Um, but it doesn't seek to be a book about how God created everything. It's basically a declaration that God created, that God is the architect and the designer of everything that we see. And so, so we know where we came from. And because of that, it helps us interpret who we are and where we're going. God created everything out of nothing. You know, if you can believe Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created every, um, the heavens and the earth, if you can believe that, then it's a piece of cake to believe the rest of the Bible story. If you can believe that God could create everything out of nothing, it's simple for us to believe that he was able to walk on water. It's simple for us to believe that he was able to raise the dead. It's simple for us to believe that, our, that he will be faithful for our salvation. If we could believe that God created everything out of nothing. In the story of Adam, we saw that we were created in the image of God. That's the only part of creation where God says that about his creation. There is something different, something unique, something precious about each and every human life. We studied our first parents and the story of their sinful rebellion, what um, we call the fall. We studied about Cain and Abel and then saw that God's judgment in the story of Noah. Then we spent several weeks studying the covenant promises of God to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the last six or seven weeks in the life of Joseph. We saw and learned from their successes and from their failures. And when we left off last week, Jacob was getting ready to journey into Egypt to see his son that he thought was dead. And he takes his family, his sons and their wives and his grandkids, a group of about 70 people, and they're beginning this journey from Canaan to Egypt to finally reunite with Joseph. And in our study today, um, we're going to go through three chapters, Genesis 48 through 50, and see the last days of Joseph's life and how, um, how Joseph's le uh, Jacob's life and how Jacob's legacy ended. These are fairly short chapters, and what I want to do this morning is basically read through Genesis 48, 49, and 50. They're small chapters, like I said, and we're going to highlight a few things along the way. And I'm going to be honest with you, this week has been nuts for us. So in terms of sermon preparation and stuff, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. So we're going to read through this, and I'm going to just highlight a few things that kind of stands out. And then I'm going to highlight on one verse that stands out that most of us are familiar with from this passage. So if you have your Bibles... Genesis 48 is where we're going to be. Genesis 48, and we're going to read all the way through Genesis 50. And it should be on the background. So it says, After this, Joseph was told, Behold, your father is ill. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, Your son Joseph has come to you. And then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me in Luz, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. I will make of you a company of peoples, and, I, and will give this land to your offspring after you, after you for an everlasting possession. Here's Jacob recanting the covenant promises of God that was given to Abraham first, and then it was 
promised again to Isaac and then to Jacob. He's recanting God's faithfulness to their family. Verse 5, And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, they're mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. And the children that you fathered after them, they shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of your, their brothers in their inheritance. As for me, when I came from Padan, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was some distance to go to Ephrath, where I buried her on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. By the way, to this day in Jerusalem, there, is a, there are soldiers that guard the tomb of Rachel in Jerusalem. Verse 8, when Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? Joseph, Jacob's old, he can't see, his eyes are dim, and Joseph says to his father, these are my sons whom God has given me. And he said to them, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Um, you've seen this in the story of Isaac and the other stories. This is important in their heritage, in their history, in their culture, um, passing the blessing on from um, one generation to the next. And now, verse 10, the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near and he kissed them and embraced them. And you're going to see this. A lot in the next three chapters, a lot of kissing, a lot of embracing um, between the family members here. Verse 11, Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. Behold, God has let me see your offspring also. You can hear how grateful Jacob is in these moments. You can hear just his gratitude that he has in the last days of his life. For 22 years, he thought Joseph was gone. And a few years earlier, he's been reunited now with his son. He had 17 years with Joseph in the beginning of his life. And then for 22 years, Joseph was gone from his life. He thought he was dead. And then in the grace of God, God gives him 17 more years with Joseph after Jacob comes back to Israel. Jacob comes to Egypt. He's so thrilled, so humbled at how God providentially cared for him and given him an opportunity not only to see Joseph, but to see Joseph's children. Verse 12, um, Then Joseph removed them from his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And so Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. See, that would be the way to do it. The older one under Jacob's right hand um, to get more of the blessings, the significant blessings, the younger one under the left hand. But verse 14 says, Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim, the younger one, and his left hand on the hand of Manasseh, crossing his hands. For Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. The God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil. May he bless the boys. And in them let my name be carried on. And the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow in multitude in the midst of the earth. Verse 17 says, Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the hand of Ephraim, and it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it to Ephraim's head, from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not this way, father, this is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. Now, if you remember the story, this is, we easily forget, but do you remember Jacob and Esau? Um, Esau was the firstborn. But Jacob connived and deceived Isaac and got the blessing that was supposed to go to Esau. And now, here's God saying, it's fit to say through, jo through Jacob that God is the one who orders things. God's the one that's in charge. Not your earthly customs, not your traditions, not what you think. But God can do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. Verse 19, but his father refused and said, I know my son, I know. He also shall become a people. He'll be good. He'll be okay. And he shall be great. But his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his offering, offspring shall be 
come a multitude of the nations. And so he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, God will make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. And then he put, thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said to Joseph, and catch this, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you. God will be with you. Have you heard those lines in the story of Joseph before? Remember in, there was one chapter, I believe it was maybe 39 or 40, where um, four times in that chapter it says, God was with Joseph. He's in Potiphar's house. God was with Joseph. He was in prison. God was with Joseph. Just four times in one chapter, God was with Joseph. And Jacob somehow picks up on that theme and reminds Joseph, listen, the God who was with you in Potiphar's house, the God that was with you in the pit, the God that was with you in prison, the God that took you all the way into Pharaoh's house, even now, that God is going to be with you. He is not going to forget you. The Lord will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you rather than to your brothers one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. Now, this is the only reference in the, entire, in the entire book of Genesis of Jacob being a warrior. We don't know what this is a reference to, but apparently there was one time that Jacob had to fight, and he had a war against the Amorites, and he took some land from them, and now he gives this land to Joseph. Let's go over to 49, chapter 49. Jacob now calls his sons. He's bringing the rest of his sons together. The other 11, he says to them, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. This is a prophetic thing that's about to happen here. He's about to speak some words of prophecy to them. In verse 2 he says, Assemble, O sons of Jacob, listen to Israel your father. And he's going to call them out son by son. And some of them, he's going to give them a blessing. He's going to tell them, God is going to do some great things through your life. Others, he's going to have to give them a warning. He's going to warn them about what's going to happen to them. And then, there's a few of them that he's going to be very tough with. He's going to have to tell them a pretty hard truth or two. And he starts with Reuben. He says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity, preeminent in power. But you're unstable, Reuben, unstable as water. You should have been preeminent, but you shall not have preeminence. Because you went up to your father's bed. You defiled it. And he looks at his, Reuben's brothers and he tells, basically tells them, he went up into my bed. He went into my couch. We talked about this a few weeks ago. George talked about this. Reuben took one of Jacob's four wives for his own. We don't know why. It could have been a power play among the rest of the family. It could have been um, struggling for security, for identity. Maybe Reuben could represent someone who struggles with a lot of lust. Not just lust for women, but maybe lust for power, for control. Wanting to be significant and take control of life, a control freak. And so Reuben loses blessings. He just basically says, you should have received all the blessings. But instead of trusting God and trusting that God will take care of your life, you decide to take matters into your hands, you lost it all. You get nothing. You should have been preeminent, but you lose it. And then he goes into Simon and Levi. Verse 5, Simon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. You remember, their sister Dinah was raped. And these two went after their perpetrators. But they didn't just go after the guilty party. They went and murdered an entire village of people. It was disappropriate a disappropriate amount in how they responded. One person committed a crime, they killed an entire group of people. Verse 6, Let my soul come not into their counsel. O my glory, be not joined in their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. They didn't care. In their anger, they killed anything that was breeding. Men, Animals, whatever, they were just angry. Great rage. Anger controlled their lives. And in their anger, they lost the blessings they should have gotten. Speaks volumes of 
how we need to be careful with how we live our lives. Lust can destroy us. Anger can destroy us. Verse 7 says, Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And that's exactly what happens. The whole tribe of Simeon will be absorbed into the tribe of Judah. Levi becomes a priestly line, and they never get any land. They have get little cities here and there, but they get no portion of land for them. They lose their blessing. Verse 8, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow before you. Judah is a lion's club, cub. From my prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from, under, from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Judah ends up being the kingly line of the nation of Israel. The royal line of David comes through Judah. And a lot of commentators think that that phrase, a tribute comes to him, is actually talking about Jesus, who actually comes from the tribe of Judah himself. Verse 11, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than vine and his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun shall dwell at the shores of the sea. They become fishermen. They shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall be at Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey, crouching between the sheepholds. He saw that a resting place was good, that the land was pleasant, so he bowed his shoulder to bear and becomes a servant of forced labor. So basically, Issachar becomes a workaholic. He's someone that doesn't know when to take rest. He's constantly working long days, long hours. And Jacob doesn't say anything good about that. He doesn't say, hey, that's a good thing. He doesn't promise blessings on that. See, some of us think that we should just work, 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 and, you know, even God rested, right? I mean, there's rest that's required, that's necessary. Rest is a good thing. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Samson comes from the from the tribe of Dan. Dan shall be a serpent in a way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his riders fall backward. And in verse 18, in the middle of all of these blessings to his children, he just bursts out in praise. He says, I wait for your salvation, O God. In the middle of all of these prophetic words, J Jacob just bursts out in praise to God. He's thinking of his sons and his grandsons and what God is going to do through them and how God is going to be faithful to his promises. And all of a sudden, he just bursts out and says, God, I praise you. I worship you. I'm not going to see it, but because I know you're alive and you're working and you're moving, what you promised will come to fruition. Here's Jacob in a foreign land, not in the land that was promised to him. And he's praising God because he knows that God is faithful to take care of him. How many times in our lives when we think we, everything goes wrong, how hard is it for us to be able to say, God, in the midst of this, I praise you because my life is in your hands. I belong to you. I know that you have what's good for me at heart and you will take care of me. And so even though the situation right now sucks, you are good and faithful, and I will praise you for it. That's what Jacob's doing here. He's saying, I'm going to die in a foreign land, but in the midst of that, I will praise you, God. And then he goes back to the next tribe, Gad. He says, raiders shall raid Gad, and he shall raid at their heels. Asher's food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal delicacies. Asher's going to be the baker of Israel. He's gonna, that's where all the good food is. That's where the nice restaurants is. It's down in Asher. Naphtali is a doe let loose that bears beautiful fawns. And then he goes into this prophetic word about Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, 
harassed him severely, and yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the mighty hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your fathers who will help you, by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the wombs, the blessings of your Father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents, up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him, the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. Jacob is overflowing in the words to the one whom he loves so dearly, the one that he had thought he had lost forever. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, in the morning devouring the prey and at evening dividing the spoils. And all of these, the narrator reminds us in verse 28, that all these were the 12 tribes of Israel. This is what the Father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to them. And then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, in the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were brought from the Hittites. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up to his feet, he drew up his feet into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. He basically goes back into bed, pulls the sheets over him, one final breath. He now goes to be with God. Do you remember in our text last week God was speaking to Jacob before he walked in and the last line that God told Jacob is, Joseph will close your eyes. Basically saying, Joseph is going to be with you when you die. Notice the next verse, verse 1 of verse 50. Joseph fell on his father's face. He closed his eyes, wept over him, and kissed him. There's something incredibly beautiful here. It's a heart-wrenching moment for Joseph and his brothers and his family, because they know that Jacob is gone, but in that weeping, there is something beautiful here, because they know Jacob is now with God. No more pain, no more suffering, no more grieving, no more heartache, no more sorrow. He's with God. And Joseph commands his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel, Forty days were required for it. That's how many days were required for embalming. The ancient Israel, Egyptians were great at this stuff. They, they're the ones that, where we get all the mummies from, right? I mean, they were good at this thing, at this stuff. And the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. There's something significant there. It wasn't just his family that wept, but the entire nation of Egypt wept for Jacob for 70 days. You know, the amount of time that's allocated in Egyptian history for them to weep for a pharaoh, the president, the ruler of the land, the amount of time that was allocated for them to weep for um, the pharaoh was 72 days. And here's Jacob, the father of Joseph, who saved their land from famine and destruction. And the entire nation pauses and weeps for 70 days. Days. The amount of integrity and faith was so visible and respected that when Joseph's father dies, they mourn as a nation almost the same amount of time that they would have mourned if their own king had died. Verse 4, And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear I am going to die in my tomb that I've hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now, therefore, let me go, please go and bury my father, and then I'll return. He's pleading with the people of Pharaoh, saying, let me go and talk to him and say, let me go bury my father. And here's Pharaoh's reply. And Pharaoh says, go up, bury your father as you made him swear. And so Joseph went to bury his father. And notice this, this is so powerful. With Joseph 
went up the servants, all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, his father's household, only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went out with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a great company. I don't know if you've ever watched the, uh, the funeral service of a dignitary or a head of state. There's a lot of um, pomp and there's a lot of festivities that happen in that funeral service. And regardless of what side of the political aisle you're in, you're there. And this is what's happening. This is like that. Soldiers, chariots, people from Pharaoh's house and Joseph's house and all of Egypt. Huge display of how much they're respected. Verse 10. And they come to the threshing folds of Atad, which is beyond Jordan. They lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation. And he made mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing fold of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore that place has been called Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. And thus his sons did for Jacob as he commanded them. His sons carried him to the land of Canaan, buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham brought with the field from Ephraim the Hittite to possess as a burying place. And after he buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Verse 15, And when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for the evil that he did to us. These brothers are living in fear. They think that Jacob was the buffer, that because Jacob was alive, they're okay. But now Jacob's gone and the wrath of Joseph is going to fall on him. And so they send this message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. Now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God, your father, and here's jo Jake, Joseph's reply. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Why would he do that? Why would he weep? Why would he cry? Because he's tried so hard, so many times, on so many occasions to be gracious to them, to show them that he trusted in God more than he trusted in them or feared them. And here they are, one more time, not believing his love for them. One more time, living in fear. And I read that, and it reminds me of my own walk with God. How I often can't simply believe that he could be gracious to me. That God ultimately has my good in mind. And so what I do is I try to manipulate the situation myself. You ever do that? That sometimes grace is just too good to be true. That sometimes you think that with everyone else you've got to earn it. And so with God you also have to show him how good you are, how hard you pray, how hard you work, um, how well you go to church, how, give you, how well you give your tithes. And so if you do that, then God has to be forgiving and accepting of you that grace might be just a little too good to be true. Can I tell you something? It is too good to be true. It's beautiful. And yet that's what makes our faith different from every other religion in the world. Grace. You can't earn it. It's a free gift that God gives to us. But it's sometimes hard for us to understand, sometimes hard for us to wrap our heads around. And so here they are standing before Joseph again and his brothers come and they fall down before him and they say, behold, we're your servants. And Joseph says, do not fear. Do not fear. Do you know the, the one commandment in Scripture that's the most prominent in Scripture is this command. Do not fear. It's the one command that's repeated over and over and over again. Whether it's by an angel or a figurehead representing God or any voice of God when God comes and speaks to his people, 
Do not fear. Don't be afraid. You know, you listen to some people and you think that the most often repeated phrase is, thou shalt not drink, thou shalt not smoke, thou shalt not chew, or go with girls that do. But that's not the case. The most often repeated command in Scripture to us as followers of Jesus is don't be afraid. I got you. I'm in control of your life. See, that tells you what the God of the Bible wants from you. That we shouldn't cower in fear through life. That we should have a healthy fear of God and not have an unhealthy fear of life and circumstances and people around us. Don't fear. And then he says, am I in the place of God? Am I God that I should punish you? And verse, verse 20, because we'll spend some time focusing on this verse in a second, but verse 20 says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And then he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Let me finish. Joseph remained in Egypt, and he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. He was 56 years old when Jacob died. He lives for 54 more years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. He gets to see his children, his grandchildren, and even his great-grandchildren. And Joseph says to his brothers, I'm about to die. The God will visit you and bring you out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Jacob made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you. You shall carry my bones from here. And this will happen 400 years later in the book of Exodus. And so Joseph dies, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and they put him in a coffin in Egypt. And the book of Genesis ends. I don't know, when I read that, I'm like, that's it? This is how the story ends? There's no big Hollywood ending in Genesis, see, Genesis is just a book of beginnings. It's not a book of conclusions. It's not the end. It's designed to make you kind of lean in to find out what's next. What happens to that coffin in Egypt? What will happen to the people of God that's in Egypt? We lean forward and starting next week, we dive into the book of Exodus and see how God delivers this people from bondage and takes them into a journey where they become the nation of Israel. Let me point out a few things from this passage. Joseph teaches us so many things. The last few chapters taught us a lot about Joseph's life, his faithfulness. But there's one thing in this text that really stands out. Here in this text, it shows us how we can avoid bitterness in our life. Bitterness. We all deal with it, don't we? There are people in our life that hurt us, they wound us, and we respond back in bitterness. Now, just this week, um, I went back into a building that I hadn't been in in over 10 years. It is a place of incredibly deep wounds and hurts in my own life. And I went for Roji's grandmother's funeral. It is a place where People hurt me, and um, a lot of horrible things happened in my life. I remember one guy stood there when we left and said, you'll never come back to this church. You'll never get back on our stage again. And as I sat there and I realized that I thought I didn't deal with it, I thought I had forgotten it, and I realized, man, there's a lot of bitterness in me about what happened here. And as I walked on stage to give a message, this verse kept coming to my mind. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And in that moment, my heart was overwhelmed that in the midst of pain and hardship, I couldn't see at that moment what God was doing, but here I am 10 years later, I can look back and say, man, God, if I hadn't gone through that this morning, I wouldn't be standing here doing what I'm doing. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. 
how do we avoid bitterness? See, some of you are dealing with life circumstances that maybe didn't turn out the way you would please. Maybe you have people in your life that can continue to rub you the wrong way and you see that your heart is getting cold toward them. How do you keep your heart from getting cold and bitter? How do you remain Christ-like when your natural inclination is to respond in hatred and anger and basically reject and forsake? How do you continue to model Jesus when life is hard? Joseph's story teaches us a lot about that. Joseph started pretty tough. He's like, you're all going to go and bow before me, and I'm going to be the ruler over all of you. But look at what he says here. Verse 20 is where I want to focus on. I'll give you four things from this verse. Verse 20, you meant this for evil, but God meant this for good. Four things. Number one, trust in the sovereignty of God. Trust in the sovereignty of God. This is the way of Joseph always seeing his life in the hands of God. No matter what others have done to me, no matter what the circumstances have been, whether they were caused by other people, that maybe a woman falsely accused me of rape that caused me to be in prison, or a um, butler and a um, baker forgets me in prison, whatever the circumstances, no matter what happens in my life, I can trust that God is in control of it. Maybe they meant to hurt me. Maybe they meant to wound me. Maybe it just happened to be a circumstance of life. But God. But God. Joseph had those two powerful words embedded in his heart and mind. But God. No matter what else was going on, but God. See, I think we need to get a hold of that in our own lives. What's going on in your life? What is it that you're struggling with? What is it that you have given up praying about? What is it that you've been disappointed by? Who is it that you've been disappointed by? Where is it that you are so exhausted that the words of Joseph speak to you, but... God. See, we need to get a hold of those two powerful words. We need to trust in the sovereignty of God. We need to trust that He knows who you are, where you are, what you're going through, and He is in control of your life. We need to trust that He's sovereign. See, God is not impressed when the odds are against Him, and He isn't even impressed when the odds are against you. You are His child. He is for you and not against you. He has His gl greatest glory and your good in mind when He is working in your life. And I want to live my life in that intersection where it says, God, for your glory let me live, and let me trust that you are working this for my good and for your glory. But God. Joseph saw his life in the hands of a sovereign God. See, we need to learn how to say that. Irvin McManus said, the more consistent characteristics of those who follow God is that their faith and is an expression of trust in God. The need is not to work up our faith in God, but to deepen our confidence in God. See, this isn't about an emotion. I'm not telling you about to get feelings, and there's nothing wrong with either one of those things. But that's not the fuel that we run on. That's not what we count on or bank on. What we count on is God. It's His sovereignty, that His, is a, his ability to transform even the most tragic circumstances of our life into a triumph. We might not understand why we're going through it, but we can understand that he's in control of it. We see this over and over again in the life of Joseph. Trust in the sovereignty of God. Number two, tell the honest truth. Look at verse 20. What does he tell his brothers? As for you, you meant this for evil against me. 
Joseph pretty much lays it out in front of them. I'm not the confrontational type. If I was in this situation, I'd probably say, oh, you guys are probably having a bad day and just did something that's not characteristics of you, and that's okay. Or, you know, you guys are usually good guys. We play together all the time. We all have our daddy issues, and maybe you're just wrestling with yours that day. Um, he could have just passed it off. He could have just said, it's not that important. But Joseph doesn't do that. He says, you meant this for evil. You meant to hurt me. What would happen in your world, in your life, if you started telling the truth? I don't mean just beating people up with your language. I'm not saying just go attack people. I mean being honest with people. 